That brings us before a particular crossroad, and the crossroad is in a way that on the one hand, there are those who would like to continue industrial affluence at any cost. This can only happen when you accept apartheid in the world. Inequality and maintenance of industrial affluence go together. If you want to go for equity in the world, you will have to reconsider the forms of wealth. You have to go for some kind of sufficiency. Because sure enough, only patterns of production which are light and compatible with nature uh, can survive. So that is the reason, it seems that is politically so important. That's the reason why there is, in the 21st century, no equity without ecology. Um, or to put it in a different way, we have arrived in a situation where to be left, where to be going for equity. If you aren't even where you are a social democrat or a socialist, only in a honest way if you are at the same time an environmentalist. Otherwise, you can forget about it. Third point, that changes, as Ashok has already, has already alluded to, um, also the notion of equity and justice in the international arena. Because it is clear that if we, in a way, envisage the future path, the future path contraction and convergence might be a model. Sure enough, the northern countries, environmentally speaking, will have to contract. They will have to get down to one-tenth of their use of fossil resources in the next 40 years. And on the other side, you have the poorer countries still, of course, having the possibility to increase their use of resources because there is dignity involved. A dignity line has to be observed. That contraction and convergence seems to me a future, future path, and Copenhagen is, of course, already a play in that, in that game, because in Copenhagen, what you can observe is that fairness becomes a matter of realism. There's no way to get at a global contract on climate without an increased input of equity and fairness, because, of course, India and China don't want to be taken for a ride, and they will say the North has not fulfilled the Kyoto public obligations, which are in any case very mild obligations, so they will stay out. So there is then ecological realism will require to exercise fairness. There is, if you, in other words, if you want, there is not going to be ecology without more equity. That brings me to my last point. The last point it seems to me the kind of civilizational change which is ahead of us requires to reinvent um, sustainable forms of prosperity. And that, in my view, goes along four paths, uh, three paths, I'm sorry, three paths, of course, cutting very much short or very long story. First, of course, our economies have got to dematerialize. They have got to be light. They have got to develop the art to create value, to create wealth, which a much lower level of energy, materials, <coughs> topsoil, water, and so on and so forth. Second, um, the second path, regeneration. To learn how to combine, to reconcile uh, industrial flows with natural flows. Uh, how to tap into natural flows, like a sailing boat does. A sailing boat taps into a natural flow, the wind, without destructing it, without diminishing it. And that is the paradigm for a regenerative economy. And of course, the third point, if you want, the third, third uh, uh, perspective is moderation. It is not to be expected that a resource light economy will be able to deliver the same high level of performance in terms of speed, in terms of comfort, in terms of planetary connection uh, as the industrial economy does. Therefore, it is wise 
to look for styles of production and living which are on an intermediate level of performance. Because after all, if you want, you will not be able to have a small environmental footprint um, without also having a small layer economic footprint. Um, I am only having made only a footnote, you know, to the old, and I will remind you of that, the old notion which prophecy of Gandhi of 1926, as he said, God forbid that India should ever take to industrialization after the manner of the West. The economic imperialism of a single tiny kingdom, England, is today keeping the world in chains. If an entire nation of 300 million took to a similar economic exploitation, it would strip the world bare like locusts. Thank you very much.